And we had another guy, um, it wasn't Gillette, Adam Hotchkiss, who he, he works with American. He was mentioning that even when some people make nutritional changes, sometimes their ApoB level still doesn't go down and they still need to, they need to go the medication route. Mm -hmm. So how would, how would you assume somebody like what, what do they need to do if they need to take that medication route as far as lowering their ApoB? And how do you know if like you're actually at risk? If like, for example, you feel as if you're in good health, you've changed your nutrition, your ApoB isn't going down. Do you then, even if you, everything feels okay, would you still say that they should take some type of medication to lower their ApoB? Okay. Firstly, I'm not a physician. Uh, so, so I'm speaking here uh, as someone who has, I've done eight, eight hours with Thomas Dayspring and interviewed a lot of physicians and my expertise, I have a master's in nutrition science. So let me just put that out there uh, for what it's worth. But uh, you're, you're targeting the, the goal ApoB level depending on your risk profile, risk profile, right? So if you're low risk, we want you at 80 milligrams per deciliter or lower, mm -hmm. even if you feel good, because you can feel good and have mm -hmm. cardiovascular disease brewing underneath the surface of the skin and, and decades down the track have a cardiovascular event that you could have otherwise avoided. I saw that firsthand. My dad had a heart attack at 41 mm -hmm. and, and I was with him. I was the only person with him. I, I saw that in person and my dad is a professor of physiology researching cardiovascular disease risk factors. Mm -hmm. So um, ironic, he didn't die. So. It ended well. <laughs> was he uh, unhealthy before that, or just? Uh... No, he was. He was representative of a, a young sort of Australian father, um, eating the typical Australian diet. He was moderately active, pretty pretty stressed, I guess, with with work. Mm -hmm. He did have high blood pressure and high cholesterol, so he had a, a few risk factors in place. Um, but to your back to your point, we have to think about this as it's it's not either or combination between your nutrition and pharmacology is really important. What we're trying to get you to is to goal. So how uh, an interesting thing to think about here is that how, how much can dietary changes actually lower your cholesterol by for the average person? Mm -hmm. And it, it depends on the extent of the changes that you make. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you look at uh, someone like Dr. David Jenkins in Canada, he's known for the dietary portfolio. I did a whole episode with him on this. And this, this was uh, a diet that has gone through quite rigorous randomized controlled trials, uh, but it's very significant changes to the diet. <laughs> People are essentially eating very low or no animal protein. They're eating lots of plant protein. They're taking phytosterol supplements, um, nuts and seeds and soy food emphasis because they, they will lower LDL cholesterol um, more so than, than other foods. And in that context of that dietary pattern, on average people were getting about a 30% drop in their LDL cholesterol. What's that equivalent to? Sort of a, a low uh, dose statin, right? So, so they were getting results equivalent to a low dose statin. Now, there's going to be people out there where lowering their, their cholesterol by 30% is not enough to get them say below 50 milligrams per deciliter. So they're going to have to work with their physician and decide if they, if they want to make some changes to their diet and retest, where did they land? Do they need to add in some help with some, some different drugs, whether that's a PCSK9 inhibitor or, or Zetamib or a, some type of statin or a new drug out now that acts very similar to statins called bempedoic acid. So there's, now there are there is a number of different options for people to explore from a, a, a pharmaceutical point of view here to help lower ApoB and get them to target. What you got, Andrew? Well, I was the one that was eating 10 eggs a day. <laughs> the um, Zaragoza diet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it, I mean, it, I've, I've been feeling fantastic. Um, body comp's changing, and this is in conjunction with starting jiu-jitsu recently. So cardio's gone up. Lifting has stayed about the same, dropped off a little bit, if I'm being honest. Um but I did get my labs drawn at the beginning of the year, and that's where like the big red, er, er, you know, thing comes out, saying that my cholesterol, I, I, I'll, I can check, but it was somewhere around two hundred for the uh, uh, LDL. Well, I'll check. How about that? And that's pretty high for LDL. Yeah, nice. yeah. And so I guess my 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 question is first off with that receptor that you were explaining about earlier, how um, it could be that I am a hyper responder or whatever the case may yeah. be. Can you improve that receptor to 
kind of handle the dietary cholesterol better instead of it being one of those things that's like, okay, you get cholesterol, now you're going to have higher cholesterol? The, the way to, to kind of approach that if you ha have been dealt a, a gene that sees you hyperabsorbing cholesterol, so that neiman pick c one like one is, is allowing too much dietary cholesterol to be absorbed really is through either limiting dietary cholesterol in the diet or taking a drug like azetamibe, which acts directly on that receptor mm. and will essentially close that gate so that you won't absorb as much cholesterol. And it's, it, it's not just absorption of dietary cholesterol through that receptor. Mm. We have cholesterol in our small intestine that our liver has produced and pumped into the small intestine as bile. It's, it's a key component of bile to help us absorb our fats. And so if you're a hyperabsorber, you're absorbing a lot of the cholesterol in the food that you're eating, but you're also reabsorbing a lot of the cholesterol in the small intestine that the liver had pumped out. Mm -hmm. And so what's the, the reason why, how this all connects back to elevated ApoB is if you're pulling in all of this cholesterol into circulation, now the liver can sense that and it doesn't need to produce as much cholesterol. To produce cholesterol, the liver sends a signal out to increase the LDL receptors to draw more back in from circulation. So the, the, the kind of pathway by which this works on is if you're a hyperabsorber, what it does is it ends up down-regulating the LDL receptor. And again, we get that backlog of those, those ships in circulation.